Would please open your Bibles to the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse number 5. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 5. While you're turning there, let's remember that this was written by Paul in his second letter to the young preacher Timothy. And what we're going to study today is the work of an evangelist. I spent almost 60 years trying to preach the gospel. So it's been sharp on my mind a long, long time ago what the Lord expected of me as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here Paul, by inspiration, is addressing a young preacher concerning his work, and so it applies to all of us. And he says in verse 5, But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. We want to emphasize that inspiration says through Paul, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof or fulfill that particular ministry or service is what he has in mind. I don't know what all the word evangelist conveys in the mind of great many people. I think probably they think of all these characters on television when they think of evangelists and many of them uh, trying to get in everybody's pocket but their own. Or maybe they think, as it is in the denominational world, that the evangelist is the pastor of a given denomination. Well, none of that is true to the authority of Christ in the words of the New Testament. It is true that many times we refer to the preachers, the minister, I prefer evangelists because every Christian is a minister. And if we're going to call him minister, let's call him minister of the gospel. And let's not confuse him and end up taking on ourselves the terminology that is foreign to the New Testament, and that is from the denominational world. And yet over the years, I have found that a great many people confuse the work of a New Testament evangelist with what people come to expect from a denominational pastor. Well, let me remind you that no denominations exist at this time. What we know as basically Protestant denominationalism was 1,500 long years into the future. The church at this time has not even fallen away, though warning has been given, such as in 1 Timothy 4, that there would be a great apostasy. And it must be understood that out of that apostasy, the Catholic Church would form. Now, they like to tell us that they are the original church, but they're not. They formed out of an apostate church. And then, of course, they divided over the years. And as the years went by, and they went further away from the authority of the Scriptures. And they don't even believe that the Scriptures is the final authority when it comes to determining how to please God on this earth. Let's realize, too, that when you read in the New Testament that we're reading while inspiration is at work and miracles existed through the miraculous gifts in the early church, so you'll find that there were apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers in the early church, Ephesians 4, 8, and 11. In verse 12 of Ephesians 4 said they were there for the equipping of the saints and the education, that is building up spiritually the body of Christ. Thus they had help directly from God via the Holy Spirit to do the great work that they did. But that was temporary and it was provisionary. 
And when the New Testament was fully revealed, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, then the need for those provisionary gifts was no longer necessary. They knew that was going to happen because the writers of the New Testament, writing by inspiration of the Spirit, were writing because they knew that would be a time coming when that's the way people would learn about Christianity. Paul says, when you read what I wrote to you, you'll understand my mystery in Christ. John understood that when he wrote the book of John, John 20 and 30, 31. When he said, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe. Well, if, if you're going to have miracles like the apostles did and those they laid hands on exercised the early church, why would you need to say, I'm writing these things? Because they knew that those direct involvement of the Holy Spirit with the members of the church would cease when God had accomplished through them what he intended. That's just a part of rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, regarding miracles in the first century. I'm interested then in the biblical definition of evangelist. The word defined uh, as we have it today uh, coming down to us with evangelists the Greek word is euangelistes now if you look at the international standard bible encyclopedia it will just tell you it's one who brings good tidings now a form of that word is euangelion and it's normally translated gospel Romans 1.16, the gospel is God's power into salvation. Romans 1.16 again. It means good news, the good news of salvation from God to man, that man can be forgiven of sins and reconciled to God and justified in his sight. It's interesting that Barnes' commentary reads, this word properly means one who announces good news. Now, it's interesting, too, that when you read through the scriptures and you read all that's involved in preaching the gospel, that to the sinner, it might mean news that you stand condemned. It did in the first full proclamation of the gospel on the day of Pentecost. Uh, brethren, is that racket coming from outside? Yes. Okay. What is it, a truck? Who's big enough to go there and tell them to shut it down? <laughs> you know what that reminds me of, incidentally? It's preaching in Singapore, and they had their building, that particular congregation, right by a um, Buddhist assembly place. And by the time, because there was no air conditioning at that time, you had the windows all up, and they would, <laughs> invariably, when you started preaching and worshiping, they'd start setting off firecrackers and everything else right outside the window, because that's part of their garing on. And so when you got something going on like that, I think of those things. Well, now back to the thrust of the sermon. So we're talking about one who announces good news. And that may be that you're a sinner and lost as you now stand. The people on the day of Pentecost thought that. They were pricked in their heart by the truth that was preached to them. They cried out, meaning, brethren, what shall we do? We also read that Barnes continues in the New Testament, it is a applied to a preacher of the gospel or one who declares the glad tidings of salvation. It occurs in several places in our New Testament, and I'll pause here and say I'm going to be citing a number of references rather than reading the scriptures themselves, so be prepared to take notes if that's what you want to do. I don't do that that often, but this time I will because there's so many of them. This word occurs in three places in the New Testament. Our passage, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 5. Then also we noticed earlier Ephesians 4.11, it appears there. And in the place where we're told about uh, Philip, the evangelist, Acts 2, 21 and verse 8. You'll remember that he preached to the Samaritans, Acts 8.4. 
through 5 and on through that chapter, verse 12. And we learn that he preached to the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts 8, verse 35. It's commonly equated with the term missionary, put that in quotes. And the reason why is that because evangelists often traveled. They were on a mission. I'd rather call Paul's three preaching journey just that, preach each three preaching uh, journeys. Everybody that's a Christian is on a mission. If they're not, they're not faithful. They may not be like Paul or somebody fully supported by the church to preach the gospel, but each one of us has an obligation to do what we can according to our several abilities to spread the gospel. Yet evangelists sometimes, as was the case with Philip, stayed in a place for a good long time. When you look at Acts 8, 40, all the way over into chapter 21, 8, or at least between those chapters, many years passed by, thought, it's thought about 20 years, and Philip appears to have stayed in Caesarea about that long, yet he's still called an evangelist. Timothy remained at Ephesus quite some time, we don't know how long, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, and he, of course, was told by Paul, as we're studying our text of 2 Timothy 4, 5, to do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of his ministry. There are other Greek terms that describe the evangelist. There's the Greek word kyrux. It's used in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. Romans 10, 14 and 15. And it means, and you see how it fits in with evangelist, to be a herald to publish, to proclaim openly. And therefore it's used of the proclamation of the gospel of Christ or matters pertaining thereto. Thus Thayer in his Greek English lexicon gives us that definition. When you go through the scriptures, you'll see that uh, they describe the work of John, the forerunner of the Christ, Jesus himself, John in Matthew 3, 1, and Jesus in Matthew 4, 17 and 23. Also used concerning the work of the apostles, Matthew 10, 7. And I've already mentioned Philip the evangelist. It's used regarding him in Acts 8, 5. And the work of the apostle Paul in Acts 28, 31. And 2 Timothy 1, 11. And what's interesting is inspiration through Peter in referencing the teaching of Noah before the flood calls him a preacher of righteousness. So it's used there in 2 Peter 2 in verse 5. Then too, Kyrux is translated minister, or rather diakonos is translated minister. 1 Thessalonians 3, 2. Now that word, of course, is a general term. It is in the New Testament regarding the organization of the church, translated variously as deacon or minister or servant. Those you realize are sort of general terms, except as it has to do with the office of a deacon. And I'll pause you and say, that's what I intend to deal with in this afternoon's sermon. So there'll be a little bit of overlap in, uh, from this sermon to that one. So that term, diakonos, is not limited to preachers or evangelists. It's used of other servants, and again, such as deacons, 1 Timothy 3, 8 and 12. But it's often used to describe, and I think we should be able to see this readily, to describe those who preach and teach the gospel. If you're not a servant of Christ, in preaching and teaching the gospel, I fail to see what you are. Acts 26, 16, it's said of Paul, along with Romans 15, 16. In Colossians 1 and verse 23, it's said of Epaphras in Colossians 1 and verse 7. And it is said of Timothy himself, 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 2. 
in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 6. We recognize, though, in understanding of the teaching of the New Testament concerning the membership of the Lord's church, the preacher is not the only minister of the church. And we've said already that's the case because Christians, which means of Christ, members of the church, are truly ministers. Every one of us is a minister. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. Remember Christ taught that he that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. So there are all sorts of things in doing the work of the church, benevolent activities, edifying the church, and so on, that's involved in being a diakonos, a servant. Now, that's what the New Testament has to say concerning the words that the Holy Spirit had the writers use regarding teachers or preachers. But we need, therefore, and I've alluded to those in the beginning, to look at terms that are not, that are not used to describe the evangelist as Paul is writing about him and instructed Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, or 2 Timothy chapter 4. I've already mentioned the word pastor. Now, you know last week, if you listen, that we had a lesson on elders. In the organization of the church, when the church is fully organized, there are elders. And that wasn't the only term that the Holy Spirit used because each term the Holy Spirit used in the New Testament describes an aspect of the work of those who oversee, superintend the work of the local congregation. But the word pastor is used of overseers, which are bishops, or elders who are presbyters, Ephesians 4.11. You might also look at 1 Peter 5 and 2 in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Now, I recognize, as I said last week concerning the work of elders, that in some cases an evangelist might also serve as a pastor, an elder, a presbyter, a bishop. But, of course, that person must meet the qualifications that are laid down for one to be able to serve in the capacity of an elder, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and Titus chapter 1, 5 through 9. And, of course, he serves with other pastors. He's not one pastor over the church. I'll add this to last week's sermon. No one pastor or elder or presbyter or bishop has any power whatsoever to authorize anybody to do anything unless the eldership has delegated power to that one elder to do such. But that's true then of any, of any member of any congregation. It is the collective decision of the elders that's binding on themselves and on the church. So he would be serving with other pastors or elders or bishops or presbyters because when you read in your New Testament, such as Acts chapter 20 and verse 17, there's always a plurality of elders. So he's not the pastor, but he's only one of the pastors if the evangelist is qualified and has been appointed and is serving as one of the elders. That must be understood. Over the years, it seems to me, and I've had this happen personally time and time again, visiting with other preachers and so forth, people will want the preacher to pray for them. They won't necessarily call for the elders, though we're specifically instructed to call for the elders to pray for us. I don't know where all that comes from unless it's hold over out of the viewpoint of actually going back to Roman Catholicism and that the priests actually stands between those in the congregation and God. And in Roman Catholicism, their doctrine teaches that he does. And thus, they expect the preacher to have more pull with God, I suppose. Well, I've seen some preachers be the last ones I won't pray for me in view of the way they live and do. But be that as it may, we all ought to be praying for one another. And uh, I'm glad if I'm 
whatever I'm, shape I'm in, <laughs> to know that all the brethren are praying for me. As I've traveled around here and there over the years and preached, and people would compliment something I would say. I would ask them, please remember me in your prayers. I'll be righteous in my life and preach the whole counsel of God. I like to know people are praying for me for that reason. But any one specific person uh, having any more pull with God other than you would be a righteous person for the right, the effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Well, that's who I want praying for me. The idea of calling the preacher reverend or in the case of priest's father, there's no such terms in the New Testament that are to be applied to a man because he's a preacher of the gospel. There's no authority for it. Let me pause here and emphasize again what we do in the church is to be authorized by our king who's an absolute monarch and his will is made known in the New Testament, his last will and testament of the Christ. Thus we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. So we're concerned about having authority for how we think of one another and how we speak of one another. That's the way that's right, brethren, and cannot be wrong. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Well, it's the New Testament of Christ, and thus the words of the New Testament is the standard of judgment. That's how I determine whether I'm a Christian or not, is to know what the Bible teaches, especially the New Testament, as to what one must believe and do to be a Christian. That's how I know my worship in the church is correct, is to have the teaching of the New Testament informing me of how God wants to be worshipped. And it's true concerning the church, in my viewpoint of it, its work, its organization, which we're talking about now, and its... Uh, worship. Thus, we let the New Testament form our views. That's the judgment of Christ manifested in the words of the perfect law of liberty, which we're taught to continue therein. A man being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1 verse 25. So the very definition of the word evangelist, along with these other words, used uh, such as preacher and minister of the gospel gives us an insight it gives us an insight and here it is into the mind of god the re revelation of his mind as to the work of an evangelist i've seen times when i know of one case to where a lady was in the hospital and called the preacher to please bring her a popsicle that's not the work of an evangelist I know one case to where a dog had been run over out in front of a member's house. It's called the preacher. They come by and moving it. Well, after all, he's there at the office doing nothing. And he only works Sunday morning and Sunday night, Wednesday. That's all. What else he got to do? Well, I admit there's been some preachers I realize that must be sitting there by the phone waiting to do that kind of thing when they ought to have their head in the book. You're not going to make full proof of the ministry God's put upon the work of an evangelist if you're not studying and learning how to study, how the Bible authorizes, how to ascertain that authority, because it's the authority of the king, and you purport to be a preacher of what? The gospel. But you can't preach what you don't know. You can't teach what you don't know. And the church ought to be content with that kind of thing. Now, as to whether a person has a person preaching for them that's f supported full-time to do so, that's left up to the bread. Maybe the circumstances, situations don't allow for that. But that doesn't excuse members of the church, men, to prepare themselves through knowledge and their own use of their talents to proclaim Christ and Him crucified and to defend the faith. There's always going to be people who are better than others in doing it, 
but they can all do it. What is the work of an evangelist? Well, it's to preach the word of God, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 2. Notice is a charge, an inspired charge by the apostle. I charge thee therefore before God. Sometimes we talk about when we first start preaching, you get stage fright to have to get up in front of folks. Well, just think for a moment. I've tried to make this clear over the years, maybe not as clear as I ought to. But when I stand up to preach, I tell you who I'm standing before that bothers me. That's God. Now, if you're going to get, quote, stage fright, unquote, there's why you ought to get stage fright. You're standing before God and you're an evangelist to preach the word. So I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his gospel that we preach. Who shall judge the quick, the living, and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, exhort, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. Tells you why, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap of themselves teachers having itching ears and shall be turned away from the truth unto fables. There are always going to be those people. That's when you need to bear down the hardest on the preaching of the truth and the clearest in the proclamation of the specifics of the gospel. How the Bible authorizes the importance of biblical authority for what we believe and what we practice and the exposure of error that which is contrary to the authority of Christ. So we're to preach the word, 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. That, of course, means especially the glad tidings of Christ, Romans 10, 14 through 15, to the people who do not know it, who have to know it and know it properly to become a Christian, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And you might say, as Philip the evangelist did in Acts 8, 5 through 35, which means you take people where you find them. Well, you've got to know them to some extent to know where they are and what they know and they don't know. And you take them where you find them and you lead them forth. And if you look at the cases of conversion in the New Testament, that's what you have. Taking people where they were in their knowledge and taking them on into all of the knowledge they needed to have to become Christians. And then we're taught, as Peter said, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. And that's edification. So the preacher has to be mindful of that. Over the years, I've seen preachers, and usually it's younger preachers, and they preach the sermon, and they don't want to preach it again. Why? Well, I don't understand that. If it's worth preparing and preaching once, it's worth preparing and preaching as many times as is needed. The, the challenge of the true scriptural evangelist in preaching the same truth because you don't deviate from the truth. It's the same truth. It's to be fresh in the presentation of it. Maybe the illustrations you use, examples, or whatever. But it's the same truth. We're to instruct the brethren of their responsibilities as Christians, 1 Timothy 4 and verse number 6. That has to do with what the Bible teaches about prayer, modesty, and I hope you read the bulletin article on that, and the role of women in the church and men in the church. Nowadays, with people trying to declare plainly that a man can identify as a woman or a fence post or a rat, I guess, whatever suits them. And a woman can do the same. People all confused over that. They're removed from the belief in God. And the scriptures is the truth of God that gives us the way of salvation. Then we need to bear down on those fundamentals more than ever of the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the inspiration of the scriptures, and all these fundamental things about man and woman, male and female. Matthew 19, Jesus said God made them male and female. Moses said the same thing thousands of years before in Genesis. That's what there is. But I don't like that. Well, you just have nothing like it. That's the way it is. I think I've said this before. <laughs> the late Brother G.K. Wallace told me one time, he said I had preached on this. One man came up and says, 
I don't like hearing about that. And he said, well, you may not like it, but you're going to hear about it a whole lot more. And that's, that's tenaciousness that's right. A stubbornness with the truth that the world needs. You're not going to whip sin with a feather duster. You're not going to do it. You're going to have to boldly stand up and declare what's what. And you see that in the work of the prophets, especially in the work of Jesus and the apostles and the early evangelists. So we see then there must be the church taught and anchored in the truth regarding what it is to be of Christ, that is to be Christians, in such matters as um, their personal conduct and their family obligations, their business duties, Titus 2, 1 through 10. Those things are covered in the scriptures. The preacher has an obligation to preach those things to members that they'll know how they ought to act before God as members of the church. Remember, most of the New Testament is written to members of the church concerning their conduct in it. They're to reprove sin. And even elders, if they need reproving, 1 Timothy 5, 19 through 21. They're to set in order things that are needed. Paul tells Titus to do that in Titus 1.5. He's to show forth the qualifications that the Holy Spirit's given for men to meet in order to be elders or to be deacons. And he's to guide them so that they won't deviate. I'll tell you something that is quite an eye-opener, and I've seen it in various congregations, where the elders might want to add another elder. They and their oversight of the church think that they might need another person if they're qualified. So they would ask the congregation to offer the names of men that they think meet the qualifications to be appointed as an elder. That is an eye-opener because just to put it bluntly, you realize how absolutely ignorant some members of the church are as to who is qualified to serve as an elder from the names that are given. In fact, it's frightening to realize that people can be in a congregation that's sound in the faith overall, hear good preaching and teaching over the years, and just to put it bluntly, to be that dumb for whatever it is. Um, when it comes to training teachers and equipping the saints for the ministry, the Lord left that up to the church. Now that might surprise some people in view of universities and colleges that have been operated by the brethren. As I said here a few Sundays ago, I think some people don't think the Lord's church can exist unless there is a college or university that's operated by the brethren. I don't think they think it can. Well, the only reason those things were ever set up was to help the home in doing what is the charge of the home to educate children. You see that in people when it comes to public school education. Most parents say, take my kids and teach them. That's your responsibility. And if you talk to teachers a lot of times that are real good teachers, they get parents down on their case because that's your job to take. No, it's not. Ultimately and finally, and you'll be called in judgment on it someday, it's the obligation of mama and daddy to do it. Now, can you get aid from other people? Yes, but that doesn't mean you stop completely having anything to do with it at all and you don't know what they're being taught. Now look at our country today. Look at public school education in general and look at higher education. All they're doing is leading people, overall, I'm speaking generalities, leading people away from God rather than to God. And if you don't see that, I don't know what to do to tell you to see it. Preachers of the gospel evangelists are to teach against false teachers and false doctrine. 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 4, Titus 1, verses 10 through 11, and verse 13. That's a specific part of their work. And yet I've seen brethren that did not want that done. I was preaching in a place one time, and this man's a good man. He's dead now. He was a good man overall. But I refer to several scriptures off and on where Paul would say, I would not have you ignorant brethren. 
Meaning, I, I don't want you to be ignorant of these matters. I want you to be enlightened. I want you to be taught. I want you to have the proper information. And he came up to me. He's very nice about it. He said, do you have to use the word ignorant so much? Well, I was just quoting God. But that's the way people think. They have these ideas. They attach to words. I don't know what it means to some people. But if you don't know the truth, you're ignorant of the truth. That's the only way to use it. The only way you're going to be enlightened of the truth is to study and to be taught. Preachers have an obligation to understand that. And they have, therefore, the obligation to show when people are teaching contrary to it. They're teaching false doctrine. One of the things, and this is of great concern to godly preachers, they're in word and in conduct and love and faith and purity, 1 Timothy 4.12, they are to be examples. Paul recognized that when he said that if after having preached to others, he would be found a castaway. So what did he do? He buffeted his body and brought it into subjection. I know how heavy that rests upon the hearts of people. Yet at the same time, I also know how brethren have their false concepts of what the work of a preacher is. I have in my files, and it didn't come from members of the church, but it's a picture about the size, eight and a half by 11 almost, of a preacher and his family, sort of like they're sitting at home in their living room, and they're like right there in the middle aisle, and the church is all in the pews, and everybody's looking down. Well, you won't appreciate that unless you've lived the life of a preacher. Am I right, Barbara? You won't appreciate that. But that's just the case. People have their own ideas as to what the work of a preacher is. They wouldn't have you come and haul off a dead dog from their house. So much teaching is, it has to be done. Much honesty and character must be there to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. They must be a pattern of good works in doctrine showing integrity and reverence for God. Titus 2 and verse 7. Of course they should be devoted to the Word of God. I've already touched on that. They must be involved in reading. I can't emphasize that enough to all you brethren who would teach. I call it devotional reading. It makes you familiar with the text. Before you ever go to looking up Greek words and all that stuff, be familiar with the English text. Know it. You may not be able to call sometimes the chapter and verse, but you can know the text. But you don't come to know it unless you spend a lot of time with it. To give time to reading, to exhortation. What does that mean? Exhorting the brethren to do what they know they ought to do. And as the old song, we've laughed about this. Somebody said we shouldn't be singing standing on the promises because of the way the brethren live. We should be singing sitting on the premises. That's just about as far as it goes with some people. So there needs to be the reading and the exhortation and the teaching on the part of preachers, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13. And also, of course, careful to handle the Word of God properly, 2 Timothy 2.15. That's always been a concern and of preachers that I know to be careful and to think a thing through. Uh, I've seen some people that I don't know where they ever thought. But anyway, thought about something, I guess. In contrast to the work of elders, passion, pastors, bishops, presbyters, elders are to take heed to themselves and to the flock, Acts 20 and 28. They have a work to do. A preacher ought to teach the truth on that. We tried to last week. And then be a great help to them. I like to think the preacher under godly elders is sort of like a, uh, eating utensil, they can through him feed the flock. Tell him we think we need a lesson on this. So evangelists are to take heed to themselves and to the doctrine, which means the teaching, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16. Well, what the work of evangelist is not, is not to do the work of elders, not to do the work of deacons in their official capacities, or other members. Paul's saying you have a work to do as an evangelist, and you do your work. He's not a hireling, though I guarantee you a great many people think that he is a hireling. 
one of the things I know among preachers who've been for, supported fully by the brethren is that they never fill the current, a part of the congregation because they know they can be bumped out the first whatever, whoever gets upset with them and you'll be surprised if you've never been there you don't know what I'm talking about so they always feel like they're uh, being run over or run out when everybody else can get to do whatever they want to whether they're trying to do right or not now you say well that's being extreme well it may be extreme but it's truth so he's not hired to do the work of other members he is supported to do the work of an evangelist He's not to be the official visitor for the congregation. He's not to be the leader of prayer at public functions. He is not to be an evangelist to be whatever a person thinks evangelist means, no matter how far into the truth of the New Testament it is. He should be honored for preaching the truth, but we would do that hopefully for everybody that loves and lives and the truth and contends for the faith. He's to be expected to take care of all the benevolence. Is that right? No. Although I've seen it in that case, and I've been there, done that. When people say all these things, been there, done that. He's not to do all the personal evangelism. Now, all the problems that arise in the church or all the physical chores, he's not to be doing either. But some people have that idea. I've had it told me, well, you're there at the church building all the time, you take care of it. My comment to one fellow one time is, look, I don't care if this door falls off the hinges. That's not my work, although I can do it. Let other members get involved in the work. Where's the deacons? That's the reason years ago when smoking was so common that it was a joke among preachers saying that the preachers are doing the work of elders and the uh, deacons are doing the work of nothing and standing around smoking. They don't smoke like that much anymore. Well, of course that wasn't true of everybody, but it points out a thing that needs not happen. It must not happen and will not among faithful brethren concerning each one knowing your personal duty to God. Members have different functions. Each should do their part. And the Bible spends much time on that, Romans 12, 4 through 8, Ephesians 4, 16. We all have a part, and we must do it. So the evangelist is to teach and preach the Word of God, the whole counsel of God. He's not to be a jack of all trades. He's not the leader. The elders are to be the spiritual overseers and leaders. He encourages, he guides, and he does that through the teaching of the word of the living God. But he's not the pastor. So in, in conclusion, again, we could expand on a lot of these things. The Lord's blessed the church with the role of evangelists to proclaim the good news.